Good morning. My name is David Hamilton. I'm a partner in the antitrust practice group at DLA Piper in Baltimore. Welcome to the podcast, Pricing Rules. Pricing Rules is our attempt to focus on antitrust issues generally and specifically on the subtopic of pricing. We're going to turn our attention to international trade, and it's not by coincidence. It's a happy event for us that we are able to talk about international trade. And I've got three great partners in this broadcast. I'm going to introduce them all briefly and then ask them to say a few words about themselves. First, we have the DLA Piper Carey Business School visiting professor for March, Lucia Tajoli. We're very happy that she's here for the month and can share her expertise and topical discussions with us. Also, Valerie Suslow, a professor at the Carey Business School in economics. Valerie and I have worked together on a different project, so glad to see you again, Valerie. And my partner in our New York office, Paolo Morante. If it happens that Lucia and Paolo slip into some Italian, we'll make sure to provide the translation for everybody. But Paolo has got an international practice in the M&A and regulatory side and concentrates a lot on antitrust issues. Lucia, would you mind providing a little bit more of your own background? Sure, David. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast and for inviting me to visit Carey Business School. I teach international economics and European integration issues in Milan, in Italy. I've been visiting the United States in the past a few times, and I'm here for this month, and I'm very happy to join you all. Valerie? Sure. Thank you, David. And also appreciate the invitation to join here and DLA's support for our visiting professor appointments. I'm Valerie Suslow. I have been at the Hopkins Carey Business School since 2015, and I was at the Michigan Ross School of Business for many years before. And my research is on explicit cartels, price fixing, firm coordination, and related antitrust policy. And Paulo. Yes, thank you very much, David. And thank you to the other panelists as well for participating in this panel. I'm Paolo Morante. I'm a partner in the New York office of DLA Piper. As uh, David indicated, I grew up in Italy, but I've been in the United States for almost 40 years. I came for college and law school, and I've been an antitrust lawyer my entire career. I focus more on mergers these days, and I'm looking forward to this panel. Thank you very much. I'm going to kick it off by talking about the presence of antitrust laws internationally and a few of the policy issues associated with that. According to the literature that's available to us, about 160 countries now have antitrust laws. Most of those have developed since 1990. Those 160 countries represent 95% of the world GDP. So the pervasive effect of antitrust laws, particularly as it affects free trade, and as we are concentrating on this today, pricing issues is apparent. It's not avoidable. It is intrusive in the way that we conduct our practices as lawyers and regulates what we need to do in advising our clients worldwide. There are arguments that the antitrust laws, both nationally and internationally, have pro and con effects. One argument in favor of the antitrust laws is that it is a tool to create and preserve open and competitive markets. The counter narrative to that is that antitrust laws can be used as a tool to stifle innovation and job creation. We know, and Valerie will talk about this, that open and competitive markets destabilize cartels. They also reduce barriers to entry and constrain dominant market share players, which is an important focus for the regulators in the United States currently. The other side of that argument is that open markets increase transnational collusion and some difficulty of detection. What we know, and particularly people like Paulo as an international lawyer, we know that we have to view not only through the lens of the United States antitrust laws, how things play out, but we also have to view the other places where we have filing needs or there are acquisition opportunities. In other words, we have to be very cognizant of how antitrust laws are viewed in Brazil or Japan, as opposed to how we view them when we practice in the United States. So today we're going to talk about free trade and macro and microeconomic effects and its relationship to antitrust law. Lucia, I'm going to come to you first. And I approached you a little while ago, knowing that you were coming to the United States about participating in this panel and 
thought maybe we could talk about your experience in international trade and free trade policy and the effect that it has and relationship it has on antitrust laws. I'd be interested, and I think our readers would be too, in your first reaction to the topic and maybe some big points for discussion. Well, my first reaction is that international trade is good for competition. It helps to have more competitive markets overall, simply because the number of competitors increases, market size, the number of potential clients increases, and this is something that certainly requires a number of readjustments and adaptation on the side of firms, but it generally is pro-competitive and positive for the final consumers. We know that international trade allows us to reach at reasonable prices a number of goods that we would not be able to buy otherwise. And we know that having more competition, larger markets is a strong stimulus for firms. So I'm generally quite favorable to open markets. I don't think that in spite of the number of shocks that we observed recently, globalization is reaching an end. Of course, there are a number of very serious issues that we need to tackle and we need to understand because there are many problems out there. But overall, I think that open markets are here to stay and it's very important to know how to deal with them. Would you say that the United States is the leading international trade open market advocate in the world community? Well, it used to be. Now, it's a little bit difficult to say that because the United States certainly has been leading the way in terms of opening markets and setting up the World Trade Organization, etc. But in the past decade or so, the pro-trade attitude of the United States has changed, definitely. So I wouldn't say that the United States has become protectionist country overall or a closed country, but the attitude has definitely changed. So I think you're saying that some of this is wrapped up in the politics, which can change in the United States from administration to administration. Certainly, it is very clear, and this is true not only for the United States, that uh, geopolitical considerations started to increasingly affect pure trade policy decision making. So in the past, trade policy decisions were most of the time set looking for economic efficiency, at least from the national perspective, trying to maximize national welfare from a pure economic perspective. Nowadays, trade policy decisions are increasingly affected by geopolitical considerations. And this is, of course, something that might give not always desirable results, in my view. Turning our attention to the topic that we're focused on, which is pricing and price levels and ultimately the effect on consumers of products. Why is it that open trade affects pricing levels and how? Well, by opening to trade, a country can produce only the set of goods in which it is most efficient and most competitive without trying to produce the whole set of goods that consumers want to buy. So it doesn't make sense to try to grow coffee in the U.S. You could technically set up greenhouses to do so, but clearly it doesn't make sense when you can import the coffee, which is grown elsewhere with much cheaper costs. And this very simple principle applies to many, many other goods. Most of us wouldn't be able to afford laptop computer or a telephone if it were not for international trade that allows to produce these goods at a much, much cheaper price. So simply by exploiting production capacities, comparative advantages, as they are called in different countries, this allows to produce more at lower prices. And if competition is there, the lower production costs become lower prices for consumers. So there's a counter narrative, and I know you don't believe in the counter narrative, and that would be that increasing open markets in international trade and the possible price reductions as a result of manufacturing in other countries, there's also a job creation or a job loss argument associated with that, right? 
That's right. But I have seen a number of studies on this. And we must be very clear on this. It's impossible for a country to be open on one side and not on the other. What I mean is that if you want your domestic firms to export abroad, you also must import and vice versa. So the job accounting effect has two sides. On the one hand, you get new jobs thanks to the expanding production of your domestic firms that can also export. You might get, of course, a reduction in other sectors because of imports. This is certainly true. But all the studies that I have seen indicate that the net effect is positive. We have never seen a country whose total job numbers has declined because of opening to trade. Certainly, there are different effects across sectors. These are important. Workers can be misplaced from one type of job to another. And this is certainly a very relevant policy issue. I don't want to downplay this. But overall, we have no example of any country that by closing down has increased its net job number. Okay. Let me change gears for a little bit and talk about global value supply chain. When we were getting ready for this talk, you mentioned the importance of global value supply chains and the effect on pricing. Would you explain that, please? Well, global value chains are, say, the acceleration on the effects of trade that we've been experiencing for many decades or centuries. In fact, what happens with global value chains is that rather than trading final products among countries, countries trade parts of products, intermediate goods, so that the production chain of a good, and this is increasingly true for complex goods, occurs crossing borders multiple times with different parts of a product being done in different countries. And this is, as I was saying, especially true for more complex goods such as airplanes, cars, engines, or mobile phones and the like. Each producer in a different country specializes in producing a particular part of that good, which is then assembled somewhere. And by relying on expertise in different countries, the overall production cost of the good, the Clients. And this is what makes many goods that we use nowadays more affordable. Now, this is certainly increasing countries' interdependence. It's increasing, of course, exposure to some potential risks as if your suppliers are far away, you can have all sorts of disruption for very technical reasons. We have seen during COVID, for example, that there were disruptions in the supply chains coming from a number of countries. You might have, of course, disruption also for political reasons in some cases. We have seen this very clearly in Europe, getting gas and oil from Russia. So you can get many kinds of disruption when you rely on foreign suppliers. But this risk, I think, is well paid off by the positive effects in terms of production costs. Brilliant. Valerie, I'm going to turn to you now. We're going to talk about one of our favorite topics, cartels, and your favorite topic and one of your favorite targets for publication and research. Can you talk about the work that you've done in the area? Sure. Thank you. So what I will be talking about Today, as we have this conversation, is based on research that I've done with Dr. Margaret Levenstein over the years. We have looked at explicit prosecuted cartels, firms that have behaved in an explicit way, communicating about prices, market allocation, customer allocation, bid rigging, and so on. So we have studied both European Commission cases over the decades, as well as Department of Justice cases, focusing on trying to better understand what the determinants are of cartel duration and cartel stability, how cartels organize internally, and then implications that understanding might have for antitrust policy. I also did some work early on on cartels in between the First and Second World Wars, but we don't have to go back that far in time. So, Valerie, I think the first time I heard the word cartel when I was a teenager and heard about the OPEC cartel, is that the most famous cartel and most studied cartel that we know about? For the general public, 
It is the most famous cartel, and the OPEC cartel certainly has been studied by economists who have looked into its effectiveness over the decades. I personally don't study the OPEC cartel because this is not companies, corporations getting together. This is a combination that is run by nation states. So I think that is the most famous over the years that people talk about diamond cartel or diamond monopoly sometimes as well. I think for the average person, the word cartel just has a negative connotation to it. But I wanted to ask you, are all cartels bad? If you're asking me, I would tend to say yes. But I will say, <laughs> starting off, just to make sure we have a common understanding here, not focusing on the nuances that may come up in legal cases, but for policy makers who are talking about this or economists who are studying cartels, the relatively well-accepted definition, when we talk about cartels, we're talking about agreements among competitors to fix prices, rig bids, allocate markets, allocate customers, basically to reduce the intensity of competition in some way by explicitly communicating. So I think when we're talking about cartels here today, that's what we're talking about. There is also coordination among firms, among oligopolists, by signaling without formal communication. That's sometimes called tacit collusion or coordination, and we might come back to that. In general, cartels harm consumer welfare. They are not merging they are not formally getting together, so you can't say that there are efficiencies in production or synergies, as some people might like to say. They are merely reducing the intensity of competition. That said, there are governments who on occasion have sanctioned or supported what they might call crisis cartels during the Great Depression in the United States in the early 30s, there was a National Industrial Recovery Act, which was a government fostered and supported legalizing of explicit coordination among firms. So the argument can be during particularly severe depression or recessions that you get destructive competition, right? Or some people might call it cutthroat competition and jobs could be lost because there could be the exit of firms. So for that reason, sometimes, hopefully temporarily, governments might foster or support what they call crisis cartels. That has been studied by economists as far as the U.S. experience. And on net, these were not good for consumers or the economy. But there is that argument that's sometimes made. You've been at this for a while, studying cartels and the durability and detection issues. What's changed over the last decade or so? In terms of fundamental cartel operations or behavior or duration and stability, I honestly don't think that much has changed. I'll come back to that after I tell you a little bit about what I think hasn't changed. The enduring features of coordination span decades, if not centuries. Firms getting together to attempt to jointly maximize profit rather than pursuing their own individual self-interest as the firm trying to individually maximize profit. And the fundamentals behind that, the economics behind that don't change, and therefore the behavior of firms and their attempts to soften competition or reduce the intensity of competition don't change. When Professor Levenstein and I have studied this, for example, the average duration of an explicit cartel, I should mention, by the way, we can only look at the ones that get caught. <laughs> This is like studying tax evasion, right? You don't see the ones that don't get caught. So there may be very successful cartels that we never see. Of those in our sample, the average duration for our sample and other samples from other scholars who have studied this empirically, very roughly, I would say, on average is between five to eight years for cartels. There are some that form and fall apart very quickly because the conditions don't support. There are others that last decades and do so very well because they learn as they go. They're quite sophisticated. So those fundamentals haven't 
changed. For example, bid rigging, not something that we'll focus on here, but that is one very common mechanism for coordinating among competitors. In the U.S., we used to worry a lot about bid rigging for school milk. You may remember some of those cases. Last year, the Department of Justice indicted a company for fixing prices on digital interactive whiteboards. The product is different. The mechanisms are the same. One thing that certainly has changed is with technology and with the speed of communication that is possible, especially for products and services that are sold online, the ability to check other competitors' prices and potentially monitor those prices and follow the leader or punish. The speed with which that is happening is much, much faster than before. And also we have the advances in pricing algorithms and the sophistication. So for me, with those things, there is an open question and others are discussing this as well as to whether that is going to fundamentally change anything about the feasibility of price fixing or explicit or tacit coordination or antitrust policy as it's directed to trying to address that. Thank you. And you just gave me a good opportunity to do a little self-promotion. We released a paper on pricing algorithms and collusive effects and the legislation that is now pending in Congress on that issue. I hope people will try to take a look at that. So, Paulo, everything that Lucia and Valerie said affects what you and I do, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we're going to drill down into that. But first, I want to ask you about your trip to Europe last week. You were meeting with deal makers and clients and talking about the enthusiasm or lack of enthusiasm for some cross-border transactions. Can you talk about that? And did you get a good read on the temperature of people and their willingness to go forward? Yes, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, I spent the whole week moving across Europe, meeting with clients and potential clients, and speaking about the significant changes that have occurred and are occurring in the antitrust landscape in the United States. I met with many different kinds of clients in different industries, from industrials to private equity firms, from high tech to food and beverage and consumer goods companies. And generally speaking, I would say there was a keen interest in investing in the U.S. and in U.S. businesses. However, there was also a profound concern, I would say, over the increasing difficulty of the process of merger review here in the United States. I think among all the things that I discussed with them, the one that they were most interested in was some upcoming changes in the Hart Scott Rodino process, which is the merger review process here in the United States. There was concern over the significant increase in the burden of preparing filings, even for deals that raise no antitrust concerns. Many of the clients I met with would be entering the United States for the first time, for example, or expanding into new areas in the United States, the types of transactions that we don't expect to raise any kind of antitrust concern. But these people were keenly interested in the fact that these proposed new rules would impose significant burdens even on deals that don't raise antitrust concerns. In particular, there was considerable surprise at the fact that there is no simplified procedure in the United States. They would be accustomed in other jurisdictions to have a fast track and a not so fast track, let's call it, in situations where there are actually questions to be addressed. And they were surprised that in the United States, the new rules do not take that into account and in fact impose a comparable and heavy burden on filers, even in the absence of any issues. I think I've seen and possibly you would agree with it, that the estimated cost increase for the changes in HSR filings is something on the order of 20% increases. Yes, it's hard to say exactly, but the FTC itself has said that it expects that if the rules are promulgated in the way that they have been proposed, preparing an HSR filing would require 107 more hours than it did before. Some of the clients I spoke with last week were computing that in terms of how many man hours, how many weeks, how many people, and that sort of thing. And they were very surprised. They also have concerns over privacy. Obviously, in Europe, they are not accustomed to the kinds of extensive discovery that we have in the United States and the documentary production requirements that these new rules would impose were shocking in some instances to Europeans. 
So let's talk about those matters that do raise antitrust concerns. What are those concerns when people come to you with a proposed deal and you're quarterbacking it? What are you identifying as the major antitrust concerns are now? Well, there's the traditional, what we call horizontal concerns. In other words, mergers between competitors, especially if they are direct competitors or they have a significant share of the relevant market. I would say even that aspect of the merger control process has changed or is changing recently under new guidelines. 30% in a relevant market is presumed to be anti-competitive. I think that would come as a surprise to most people who went through the process even just two or three years ago. But in addition to that, we have an expansion of the viable or potential theories of harm that the agencies are looking at. So we have expanded concern over vertical deals, in other words, deals between firms at different levels of a production chain, but also when there isn't such a direct vertical relationship, but when the two parties may be serving customers even with complementary goods, and there might be what we call portfolio or conglomerate effects. Those are theories that in the United States for a long time had lost validity. The agencies didn't really think about them, but now it seems that they will be looking for ways to bring those theories within the realm of valid claims to challenge a transaction. I would say also, and maybe most relevant to this discussion, there's other concerns that are coming into the antitrust analysis that we would not have thought of as being traditional antitrust concerns. So, for example, questions of who are the sponsors of a particular deal? Are they from what are being called countries of concern? And that primarily, I would say, means China as a practical matter. And traditionally, we would never have thought that the origin of the money for a particular transaction would be a cognizable element in an antitrust analysis. But it seems like both in the guidelines and in the new HSR rules, a lot of information will be sought about where the source of the money is, and that may affect the antitrust analysis. Another area is labor. Historically, that was not an area that the antitrust agencies would have focused on, but today they have demonstrably said that they will, and they have in fact focused on a merger's effects on labor markets. Might have to have you back because one of our upcoming episodes is going to focus on effects of mergers and on labor. Yeah, the DOJ has brought cases already and won, so that is definitely an area that matters. So I'm sure that listeners know by now that we could spend a day or so doing this podcast, but we're about to go into the last chapter. And what we have heard from our listeners is that they really like us to tell them what we're seeing out in front. What do we see in the near term and long term future? So I'm going to go around with everybody and ask everybody to kick in on your ideas about what are you seeing in the future as concerns in your world? Lucia, let's go back to you again. As I mentioned, and I think that fully in line with what Paolo just mentioned now, one of the concerns is really this mix of economic policy concerns and economic consideration together with geopolitical considerations. It's impossible to make a ranking of the relevance of the two things. I'm not attempting to do that in any way. But what I see as a potential concern is the fact that mixing the two might not give appropriate results. In this respect, the world has changed a lot in the past couple of decades because when we had direct confrontation between different blocs back at the time of the Cold War, the confrontation did not involve any economic issues because basically from an economic perspective, the blocks were fully separated. Now we are in a very different setting in which we have very strong economic ties with countries with whom possibly we don't want to have political or strategic alliances. So this is why the situation is getting increasingly complex. And I see this as a reason of concern. On the other hand, let me stress this. We have also seen in the last decades that more trade, more globalization, has improved welfare for all countries, as I was saying before. The poverty at the world level has declined very steeply, and this has increased stability overall at the world level. So I think that compared to some years ago, in spite of all the shocks and the conflicts we are seeing these days, there are more sources of stability than there used to be 
20 or 30 years ago. So this, I think, is a very large opportunity. We have seen this directly in Italy, for example. Let me talk about my country. The increase in purchasing power of middle classes in Asia or many other areas of the world has done a lot to improve the stability and the economic profits of many firms in Italy that have reached those markets, for example. This is the first example that comes to my mind. So I think that there are many, many opportunities there, but there are also more risks than there used to be. Great. Valerie? Thank you. What I'm thinking about in terms of the theme of this discussion and my own work is that while we cannot be sure that market integration or globalization or just opening markets will destabilize all cartels or prevent other cartels from forming, we know that falling prices is one motivation for cartels to form. And this has happened at times when markets have opened up. So we can't be sure that will always reduce cartel activity. But I think we can be fairly sure that if the government steps in with much more protected markets, the government is making barriers to entry for the companies in those national markets. And that will reduce the extent of intensity of competition, unless it is a national market where by its nature, it is rather fragmented. So I would be concerned about the further rise of concentration and market power within domestic national markets if protectionism continues to increase. Paulo? Yes, I would say that we should anticipate as we were just saying, a significant expansion in the areas of concern for antitrust authorities, particularly in the U.S. Historically, things like anti-dumping rules, which are more directly associated with trade issues, global trade issues, national security concerns, these kinds of things were the purview of different agencies. You just didn't come across them when dealing with the U.S. antitrust agencies. I think that has changed. It's changed both from within the agencies because of new merger guidelines that have come out, these proposed HSR rules that I mentioned a moment ago, but it's changed also systemically. At the beginning of the Biden administration, the president issued an executive order in which he called for many things, but among other things, for a whole of government approach to antitrust enforcement. And I think what this is going to mean, it already means more communications between different types of agencies that we used to think of as being siloed, and therefore potentially a more political flavor to antitrust merger review, which in turn could be a domino effect having other agencies in other parts of the world also escalate in their political inclinations. And that could create a very difficult landscape for merger reviews. Yeah, we call that executive order issued by the Biden administration a gift to us antitrust lawyers because it's keeping us busy <laughs> for sure. So that's where my focus is for the near-term future. And I want to thank all three of you for participating in this. I'm like I said, I wish we could do this longer and go a little deeper, but I think we have finished up the topics for this podcast. And thank you very much. And thank you to our listeners. That's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to DLA Piper's Pricing Rules Podcast. All information, content, and materials contained in this podcast are for general informational purposes only. This podcast is intended to be a general overview of the subjects discussed and does not create a lawyer-client relationship. Statements and opinions are those of the individual speakers and participants and do not necessarily reflect the policies or opinions of DLA Piper LLP US. The information contained in this podcast is not and should not be used as a substitute for legal advice. No listener should act or refrain from acting with respect to any particular legal matter on the basis of this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. This podcast may qualify as lawyer advertising, requiring notice in some jurisdictions. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. DLA Piper LLP US accepts no responsibility for any actions taken or not taken as a result of this podcast.